personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello, everyone. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Resistance Library podcast, brought to you by Ammo.com. Now, Sam, I got to confess that I don't know heads or tails from nationalism and patriotism. I hear both words thrown around by, well, people who hate America and condemn both. And I've often wondered, is it ever excusable to feel any sense of pride in your country? I know nationalism and especially is... uh, is demonized a lot. Are these just two conflicting ideals, complementary? You got to enlighten me because I'm a bonehead. I'm a bit of a bonehead myself, so we'll do our best to slog through this one. Yeah, you, you can talk faster, though. <laughs> That's just because I'm from further south in New England than you, because it's because I'm a flatlander. Yeah, uh, my parents' lead bathtub didn't do me any favors either. <laughs> So people use the terms nationalism and patriotism uh, interchangeably, and I get why. But and 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 to be fair, they have some overlapping meaning, and and it's a difficult kind of thing to tease out. I mean, I think we have a, um, I think we have a unique take on it here, though, that I want to kind of share with you. Um, I first of all want to say. I don't think that nationalism is just bad patriotism. Um, I also don't think that there's anything totalitarian about its nature. And I think that that would be um, like obvious very quickly when we get into this article. But I'm going to say the short, the quick and dirty version is nationalism is for nations. And we do not really live in a nation in the United States. We live in a country. We have a republic. But uh, and while I would argue that there is it, that there is a historic American people, uh, which you know I think is not I'm not using as a euphemism for for whites uh, or white founding stock because I certainly think that uh, the the whole concept of foundational Black Americans uh, is real, and I would not suggest that that you know foundational Black Americans are. Uh, any less a part of a historic core American nation than, say, the Scotch-Irish or the Knickerbockers or um, any of these kind of old colonial pre-revolutionary ethnic uh, cultural groups in the United States. I think all of that is is actually important to kind of point out because I know that there's a lot of people who use the term like historic American nation as this, you know, dog whistle uh, and I, I am not using it in that fashion. Um, I just think that it's, you know, that there was a founding stock of this country and it was made up of a certain group of people. And, you know, I, I just think it's, this is a factual statement and that it's difficult to impossible to honestly and thoroughly discuss American history without acknowledging that though the lines are very blurred. It's so muddy. Uh, you know, I mean, you got guys named like, Peter Wachowski, who have ancestors who came over on the Mayflower. I mean, it's not an easy thing to, to tease out. So let's get down into what, what it is we mean by this, give you a little food for thought. So I want to start by talking about how both of these concepts differ from uh, libertarianism and conservatism. We don't need to parse out the difference between the two. Uh, patriotism and nationalism or the difference between libertarianism and conservatism to talk about this because libertarianism and conservatism have something very important in common and nationalism and patriotism have something very important in common despite their despite their in my opinion clear differences um so libertarianism and conservatism operate from a similar and somewhat overlapping set of principles and then you attempt to divine what the most ideal expression of that could be in the real world libertarianism has a very clear philosophical principle more liberty is always good um doesn't matter what the consequences of it are you know they though i think one of the things that libertarians do that i 
find kind of intellectually dishonest is that they say, well, libertarianism makes everything better for everyone all the time. And like that clearly cannot be true. Uh, even if we just say it makes things worse for people who are you know, suckling at the federal teat, certainly somebody suffers when we end these social programs that all of us love so much. American conservatism mm. is a completely different is a completely different thing than European conservatism. Um, it's very very difficult to kind of divine what precisely it means, but I would argue that. American conservatism's defining feature is that it believes in limited government, not small government, limited government, government that is limited uh, by the Constitution, I think, is probably the defining f- the if we're going to pick one single thing. I'm going to say that's probably the one defining feature we can take. American conservatism and libertarianism and collapse them both into the idea that they both believe that freedom is always good. Now, I don't, I'm not trying to oversimplify or make a straw man. We're not, this isn't a podcast about libertarianism and conservatism. So if you want to direct your rage to me at Sam Jacobs, 1776 on Twitter, go ahead. But I'm not saying anything at all about libertarianism or conservatism. I'm just attempting to find a very simple way to talk about what they have in common. Nationalism and patriotism, on the other hand, might and often do uh, find value in freedom and liberty, and they might even make a secondary goal of it. But the uniting principle of each is that the country itself, the success of the body politic, the, um, I would say, the community, not the collective. And I think that that distinction is very important, that that is the thing that is the most important. So, you know, for example, um, the libertarian response to big tech censorship is more freedom. It's just that for everything because they have a set of underlying principles and then they attempt to figure out what the thing that they can do to make uh, their policies in conformance with those principles. Nationalism and patriotism, on the other hand, is more concerned about results. Um, I would say that conservatism and libertarian are philosophically driven ideologies or what we might call non-consequentialist ideologies, whereas nationalism and patriotism are pragmatic ideologies. The proof is in the pudding. It works or it doesn't. It's not as much about an abstract abstract set of principles than it is about getting a certain type of result. Conservatism and libertarians want to do the right thing. Nationalists and patriots have a more ends justify the means type of philosophy. I'm not attempting to paint them as some sort of soulless, amoral Machiavellian viewpoint. I certainly don't think that that is the case. And I also think that, you know, nations and countries have um, culture and values and things that, you know, is definitely part of their, their, their goals. Part of the goal, you know, I mean, the goal of American patriotism as a political movement is, I would argue, to preserve the American way of life. And the American way of life is freedom and other things as well. But, you know, America and freedom, it's peanut butter and jelly. Uh, you can, it's hard to think of one without the other. It's worth noting that um, Sam Francis was an advisor to Pat Buchanan during his 1996 presidential campaign urged Pat Buchanan, who I love, to not even compete with the rest of the field for the mantle of conservative. Who's the most conservative? He told them not to do it because it was like playing on somebody else's playing field. He said that he should identify as a nationalist, a patriot, or an America firster. Uh, Sam Francis was extremely influential. His ideas, anyway, were extremely influential on President Donald Trump's 2016 campaign, which I would argue was one that was basically driven by um, patriotism. I I don't think that uh, the economic issues that people talk about so frequently were irrelevant, but I think that, and I, you know, there's data to back this up, that the thing that really drove people to the polls for Donald Trump was that they loved America, they loved American symbolism, they loved the American way of life, and they thought that he defended those, and Hillary Clinton 
was opposed to them. And I would, you know, I think that they were correct about that, but that's, I'm just explaining that that I think was more what got him elected than, you know, infrastructure or whatever. Yeah. Trump had that beautiful visual of a big wall, whereas Hillary was spitting weird, slimy green eggs into glasses of water. Um, I knew she lost the election when she, when she started talking about, you know, uh, when the guy, when, no, when the guy yelled Pepe, that was the official. She, she's, she mentioned Pepe specifically. I no, no, no. Saying. It was, it was a guy in the audience. She was talking about, you know, the, Ooh, the scary specter of the alt-right and it's, and it's, uh, you know, headquarters in Quantico and some guy in the audience just yells out Pepe. It's, yeah. He started yes. to do it. But she, I think she did mention, did she mention Pepe? At some point. I swear to God, she mentioned those darn green frogs or something like that. But I'm I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it on YouTube or, or Google where I won't find it. But I well, swear try, she alluded to a frog at some point. Try Duck, Duck, Go. I mean, I, I feel like I've heard people say that. And I feel like it's one of those things that just like got Mandela affected into mass consciousness. Like Tom Cruise jumping up and down on Oprah's couch. Tom Cruise never jumped up and down on Oprah's couch watch that watch what tom cruise did on oprah on youtube and you're like i swear he jumped up and down on her couch yeah because you heard somebody say it so many times and then after the debate trump went to the bathroom where he pulled his pants around his ankles and said it feels good man <laughs> nationalism and patriotism are also very uh stand in contrast i would argue that they almost define themselves in the 21st century in contrast to globalism or at the very least, um, multinationalism or, or sort of transnationalism. You know, these transnational institutions like uh, the European Union, the World Bank, um, you know, whatever they call NAFTA now. I think that these are really good um, examples of that. Uh, globalism likes these things. I mean, and it, it, I know that they don't call themselves globalists and, you know, they usually just call themselves liberals or centrists or whatever. But um, they just think, you know, technocrat, te- technocracy um, and rule by elites and experts like the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberg Group or the uh, you know, Open Society Foundation or um, the World Economic Forum. You know, these are known as uh, NGOs or sometimes quangos, which is which short for uh, quasi autonomous non-governmental organizations i just like saying quango i think it's fun to say i love it ngos always present themselves as some kind of uh politically neutral entity that's just about good people doing good things for the world amnesty international for many years was organized uh to defend people who were held in jail as uh, political or religious prisoners they now lobby for legalized abortion and liberalization of gay marriage laws in the United States. This, this kind of scope creep about these organizations. Um, this is also how uh, George Soros exercises power over the political processes of countries. We have a whole article about George Soros, which I think is a really solid piece, and I would urge you to go read. Um, you know, he was expelled from Hungary and Myanmar, these organizations, these open society groups. They always have these inter- these these very generic sounding names, which I've mentioned before, is like a, always a giant red flag to me. United We Dream, International Rescue Committees. Um, they are difficult to attack on the face because are you? I mean, you like dreams and rescues, right? You like kittens and puppies, and if you don't, you're a I bad like kittens person. And puppies. I do. I do so like start animals. The kitten yeah. Puppy Foundation. I mean, if I had his money, I would probably spend more of it on helping animals than anything else. Yeah, I've already picked out my animal charities for when I win the Powerball on Saturday. I'll keep doing the podcast with you, though. Awesome. I love it, because I really was just thinking today that I really hope that we don't have to find another (laughs) (laughs) co-host. Globalism is a, uh, you know, it has an international kind of focus, but it also has a clear hostility towards the nation state. Uh, p- particularly when the nation state does things that it doesn't want it to do. I mean, part of why they hate hated President Trump so much, why they hate Bolsonaro, Sorrow, uh, why they hate Orban, uh, why they hate Marina Le Pen, who hasn't been elected yet, possibly, is because they're always throwing a monkey wrench in the works. 
You know, they they want to uh, they want uh, the globalists want a certain thing, and the people don't want it, and they use these nationalist or uh, populist or uh, you know patriotic political parties to act as a sort of firewall against these institutions, and they don't like that. So, yeah, Poland is another place. I mean, um, Poland and Hungary are really good examples because. They're two places where, like, in a single year, all of the all of the left and liberal parties were wiped out in parliament. And I don't mean like 1994 Republican Revolution wiped out. I mean, like, there were zero because hmm. Hungary and Poland were just like, yeah, we don't really like liberalism and uh, we're not going to do it here. Um, and then, you know, that's obviously evidence of dictatorship or whatever, because everybody just everybody wants everybody wants their uh their country to be san francisco simple as everybody wants to be stepping over heroin needles and human waste in the streets and like i mean this is what then you know they want like late third late third trimester abortions and stuff like it's such a strange you know the the poland thing in particular is very weird because uh Poland has the highest weekly church attendance of any country in Europe. So, you know, no kidding. They vote for anti-abortion laws in that country. It's, yeah. it's not no very difficult there. to put together. I would argue that a defining characteristic of nationalism and a great way to start talking about how nationalism is both more suited for Europe than the United States and also how it's different is revanchism. Uh, you may have not, you may or may not have heard the word before, but you're going to get the concept very, very quickly. So it's, it comes from a French word meaning revenge, and the term itself, although not the ideology, the idea that drives it, originated in the period between the Franco-Prussian War and the First World War, and it was a specific uh, reference to the French ambition to take, retake lost provinces in giant air quotes there, uh, the lost provinces of Alsace-Lorraine, which they lost when the uh, Prussians won the Franco-Prussian War and formed the German Empire. Irredentism is like not exactly the same thing, but that Venn diagram is so close to a circle that I don't think it's worth even picking the two apart. Basically, the idea is this. Take the country Serbia. If you're my age, uh, you remember the 90s, you remember the Yugoslav Wars, you remember the term Greater Syria, or Serbia, rather, there, though there is a Greater Syria. Uh, there is a revanchist, you know, or irredentist uh, it, Greater Syria. And or Serbia, or, ah, God, I'm all, I'm all, I'm all tongue tied between Serbia and Syria. But yeah, okay, yeah. let's go, let's talk about Greater Serbia. Um, Serbian nationalists don't think that the country of Serbia is the entire Serbian nation. They believe that there is territory outside of Serbia and Croatia, Montenegro, and elsewhere that's part of what they would call the natural borders of Serbia. And they want it reincorporated into the legal borders of Serbia so that the nation can be made whole. The point of this is not to pick on Serbians who, like, I don't want to wade into the any of the uh, dynamics of the Yugoslav war, but like plenty of people did plenty of bad stuff during the, the Yugoslav war, the lines between who's a good guy and who's a bad guy on the kind of, you know, bird's eye level are not very, not very clear. And all, and also I think it's worth pointing out that, uh, you know, losers don't get prosecuted for war crimes or winners rather do not get prosecuted for war crimes. It's only losers that get prosecuted for w war crimes. So um, and basically every country in Europe has some kind of revanchist faction. You can usually find like maps of them. It, a lot of times they're very, very small and marginal. But to give examples of what's going on in Europe, um, Spain wants Gibraltar back so bad that they banned the Ballad of John and Yoko because it's of the line married in Gibraltar near Spain. Uh, huh. Implying that Gibraltar. Really? Yeah. Yeah. True story. Um, Gibraltar is Spain, and so they the Franco would not uh, allow the song. I mean, I doubt he personally ever heard it, but you get what I mean. Uh, the Megala ID, I may be pronouncing that incorrectly, but that is the Greater Greece that includes uh, most of the coast of Anatolia, the Ionia uh, Islands, 
Crete, um, possibly Cyprus, you know, so Greece outside of Greece. I mean, it was made a lot more sense back, back before, uh, the Turks pogromed the Greeks out of Turkey, greater Hungary, greater Russia. Why is this? Why is there no movement in the United States, uh, to, for example, annex parts of Canada or retake the Philippines. I, I may be the one man constituency for like retaking the Philippines, but th- that kind of is, you know, proves it. Cause this is not, a, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense. Like there's just not, you don't think of, of, of there being like separated brethren living abroad who have a kind of American, uh, nationhood about them. So, yeah, the food's too spicy and the spiders are too big. I say they're doing all right on their own. Indeed. But I, yeah, I, I mean, I just, I want America to be a power in the Pacific and, you know, I think the, the window kind of closed on, on America having. Yeah. The Maybe we can liberate Australia next week. <laughs> um, that is actually part of my plan for the uh, greater American co co prosperity sphere of the Pacific is the annexation of, uh, Australia, but y'all ain't ready for that conversation. So we'll just keep, uh, we'll just keep on this in America, uh, and Switzerland, which we're going to talk about more in depth in a minute. It's, it's a bit of a nonsense question. We did talk a bit about the historic American nation. Um, Scotch Irish stock, I would argue are a gigantic part of that. I mentioned the Knickerbockers, the original Dutch inhabitants, uh, of this country, I think that uh, you know, as I said, what I what have, have been termed foundational Black Americans or American uh, African American descendants of slaves is another kind of chunk of that. Uh, certainly, Native Americans would be part of the historic American nation, but I don't think that you know that even even that's not a cohesive whole, you know. And even if like, let's just say, okay, let's just say it's it's white people. Uh, who can trace their founding to their, their arrival in this country of the Mayflower or something. Um, that still is not, that's still a very diffuse group. And as I mentioned before, you know, um, uh, well, you know guys with names like uh, <laughs> Walter Soapcheck, uh, you know, he could have a, he could have a Mayflower ancestor. I mean, it's just, there's so much intermarriage between, ethnic groups in this country that it's difficult to kind of tease out who would be American in that sense. Though there are the Scotch Irish famously like to fill out their census forms and put their nationality down as American. America is not a nation state. It is a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-confessional state, uh, which has more in common with Switzerland than France in this regard. So let's talk about Switzerland which, um, you know, what's w- one really good thing about Switzerland? The flag is a big plus. <clears throat> I, I was just about to, God, oh, hey, editor, yeah. leave that in. Let them know how dumb I am. <laughs> <laughs> and for some reason, we I have always rec- want to insert a big Phillips head screwdriver into their flag, but so for some reason, it's insane. we have a square flag on there or a rectangular flag on there, and the Swiss flag is a square. Yeah. Yeah, what's up on that? It's not as cool as the double triangle in the Nepalese flag, but it is. Weird I like North situation. Korea's flag because they made it extra long. It is a very, it is a very long flag. Uh, I would say that the most aesthetic world flag is hands down Japan. I just don't like. I don't, I don't think there's even a serious contender other than Japan. Japan looks like a lady's bed sheet. Yeah, you're not a fan of the Japanese flag. I could have come up with that in two seconds. You know, it was a real man's flag, Gaddafi's Libyan flag. I knew you were going to talk about the green flag. I Easy knew that's where you were going with this. You know, he probably hung over that morning. They came up to him, sir, we need our new flag. A green, get out of here. I'll just make it green. Make it green. And then do you actually, do you know why it's a blank green flag? That's his favorite color. Um, it's not a bad guess. And it's the and that answer. Is? That's, it's pretty close. Um, it's, it's, it's the color and name of his like book, which I've never read, but can imagine is just bonkers is just like absolutely bonkers. It's his like foray into, you know, cross promotion, Gaddafi, serious, serious thinker. And it's like, you know, blank because they had this whole, anyway, Libya, Libya under Gaddafi is like one of the strangest 
political entities to ever exist in in modern history. But we digress. Let's talk about Switzerland, which I believe is the country that has the only country in the world with a constitution older than the United States. Um, though you could correct me on that. It has a very old constitution, though, is kind of the main thing. Um, Switzerland is anomalous among European nations. It was originally formed as a defensive alliance between several small territories, which are now known as cannons, which just banded together for defense. They did not intend to become a nation, and they didn't. You know, Switzerland's not a nation. If you have Swiss heritage and you're in the United States and you think of yourself as being having a kind of Swiss identity, that's fine. Um, if you go, so this is the way I, you know, there's the, the cans all have all kinds of autonomy. There was a uh, one canton, Appenzell in Erhoden, which is like, man, my German pronunciation is not what it used to be. They did not give women the franchise until 1991. But the, and, and that's the thing is you could do that in Switzerland because their constitution doesn't really restrict what the various cans can do. They speak four different languages. They have, you know, two or three different religions, uh, all kinds of mishmash of different ethnicities in that area of the world. And when you cross the border from Poland to Germany, you're going to find a lot of people who speak, who despite living in Germany, speak Polish and consider themselves Polish and, and vice versa. You go into, you know, you go into Poland and there you're going to find a lot of people who consider themselves Germans. But when you cross the border from Switzerland and in, into Italy, you're not really going to find anybody who identifies as Swiss unless you're speaking to a tourist. Well, what is, why is this? Um, like being an American, Swiss identity is mostly about uh, identity and values. It's not a blood and soil nation. Um, I don't think that the term blood and soil nation is, is, is you know, necessarily um, fascistic. It, I think it's a good way to start talking about the contrast between the uh, nationalism of a country like France, which has an ancient people who've been there for God knows how long, and the United States and Switzerland, which don't really have a, uh, like, a nation in the same way that Germany, Spain uh, Spain actually is kind of on the cusp there, but we, we, you know, we'll talk about that I think a little later. Um, so yeah, it's not like terribly obvious that you can become Russian simply by living in Russia. You, know, you may be able to get a Russian passport, but like, there's an ethnic component to being Russian, and I would argue that there's not um, the same sort of ethnic component to being an American. So Israel is an example of a country that is very, very close to being explicitly ethnic in nature. Not anyone can become an Israeli citizen. Indeed, most people cannot. Not every Jew can become an Israeli citizen. Uh, if you're a Messianic Jew, you are not covered by the law of return. Law of return covers those with a Jewish mother or maternal grandmother, Jewish ancestry, uh, which means father or grandfather, and converts to Judaism of the Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform de denominations. Uh, for the latter two, you have to convert outside of Israel. You can't move to Israel and convert to being a conservative Jew. And it explicitly excludes uh, what we might call I, I, ethnic Jews, but I don't. That's not the best term for it. But uh, cultural Jews. I don't know. What the, I don't know what the right term is for like you know non. Uh, non people who are not religious but maintain a Jewish I identity. Um, certainly, the you know line between culture and religion in the Jewish community is not as clear as say Catholicism. So uh, you can't just you know like uh, trying to you know like uh, Rob Reiner is not eligible, huh. uh, despite his background because he's not a, he, maybe he is a practicing you know conservative jew i've no, i don't think he is uh but you know ben shapiro would be welcome and uh they can have him as far as i'm concerned <laughs> well you don't like facts and logic i hate facts and logic don't you know this about me would yet you like to, would you like to hear a joke yes about jews <laughs> okay three jewish ladies three jewish ladies go to a restaurant the waiter comes up to them and says ladies is anything all right Oh, that's a good one. Um, Dave's Jewish for anybody <laughs> playing at home. We're not just like 
dipping into a uh, casual anti-Semitism on the show. Uh, Ethiopian Jews were not recognized for right of return until 25 years after the founding of the state of Israel in 1973. So, you know, Israel was founded in modern times, is a is largely comprised of immigrants. I believe the primary ethnic group in Israel is like Soviet Jews or Russian Jews. Is that accurate? Do you know? I have no idea, but it makes sense that the nation of Israel is mostly people who've moved there in the past, you know, X number of years. Yeah, it's in the last, you know, 70 years or whatever it is. Um, the United States and Switzerland are not nation states. Nation states mean that there's primarily one group of people uh, living on one group of land for a long period of time, speak a common language, usually ha- share religion in common. Germany is different because Germany has a Catholic South and a Protestant North, but like France is a Catholic country. Russia is an Orthodox country. Um, Sweden is a Lutheran country. Switzerland has Lutherans, Calvinists, uh, you know, Catholics kind of, if we're looking at the longer term and obviously there's uh, uh, different religious groups in, in these countries, but I, I don't know if uh, Switzerland ever had a, uh, uh, ever had a official religion because you know, it's been an, it's been a religiously diverse and linguistically diverse country. So what is it that makes up Swiss identity? It, Cause it's not lineage. It's not religion. It's not language. It's basically like we have in the United States. What is it that makes Swiss identity? Well, Swiss identity is the civic values of Switzerland, uh, much like we have the Constitution and things like that in the United States. Uh, pride in Swiss history. You know, I don't know and really anything about Swiss history other than William Tell. But, um, you know, things like what, may, what makes you proud to be an American? It's not really American blood because it's that's kind of a nonsense term it's more like the moon landing world war ii motown uh george washington cutting down the cherry tree things like that that make up american identity and alpine imagery they liked all the mountain stuff so the, i think our equivalent of that would be you know eagles flags those kinds of uh civic uh images and also you know the Amber waves of grain and purple mountains, majesty, and all of those kinds of things. Um, the United States, much like Switzerland, has a large number of a much larger number of ethnic groups uh, than the, the the Swiss do. Uh, and, but what we have in common, uh, at least until people started denigrating American history and attacking the very notion of assimilation, is that we all shared what could broadly be defined as a set of American values. Um, I think that these are mostly, you know, and there's disagreement about what these are and how they ought to be enforced and expressed. Uh, But people until very recently believed that there was a set of American, you know, almost everyone believed that there were American values, that these values were good. And the question was specifically about how we were going to uh, express these ideas in the public sphere. I think free speech is probably the most obvious American value, though people don't necessarily believe in that anymore. Um, you know, the attack on statues. No, not remotely. No, 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 totally not. Um, I mean, even though they'll, they'll openly say there's a book right now, it's called The Case Against Free Speech. Um, it's, been out for a couple, <laughs> it's been out for a couple of years, but uh, and guess the po- politics of the guy who wrote that. So and also there's, you know, all the attacks on on statues, which I would argue are basically attacks on American history. I mean, I don't. I do not have any any skin in the game of relitigating the American Civil War. I'm from New England. I, I had ancestors who fought in the Union, but like I, I could care less about you know rehabilitating um, Confederate Confederate heroes. But I also you know I think that the um, attempt to take those statues down is a pretty clear and transparent attempt to remove American history with an, with an eye toward rewriting it. I mean, the recent removal of the Robert E. Lee statue is a really good idea, a really good example, rather. Uh, Robert E. Lee was, was not a proponent of slavery and, in fact, spoke actively against it. And they, you know, they want to remove statues of him so that they can say that he yeah. was, you know, this dyed-in-the-wool Klansman, which is just nothing could be further from the truth about Robert I, E. Lee. I love the argument that, oh, well, you can still go see the statues at a museum, 
And of course, the museums aren't going to put them on display because they're run by the same people who insisted the statues be taken down. Yeah. And even if they were like, you know, they provide them with with what we might call euphemistically context about, um, you know, Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, you're a bad person for looking at this. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I I think it's just very, very trans, very, very transparently an attempt to um, rewrite American history with the intention of demonizing it. So that's all going on in the United States. Let's talk about nationalism and patriotism in the United States and the United and the United Kingdom. Um, this is very, very similar in both the United States and in and, and the United Kingdom, which isn't very surprising because you know I um I'm a big believer in like you know um, being uh, that a- a- anglophobia was good enough for my ancestors and it's good enough for me. But um, to a certain sense, they are the, the, the mother country, so we have a lot in common. Uh, before the Civil War and the mass migration of the postbellum period, the United States was home to the descendants of European founding stock, African slaves, Native Americans, Chinese immigrants, and others. This is prior to mass uh, immigration into the United States, which began after World War or after the the uh, Civil War, and really kicked uh, into earnest in the early 20th century. The United Kingdom is comprised of four uh, formerly independent from one another nations. There's England, uh, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. So what that means is that in both the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, nationalism means that you want to reduce the size of the country rather than expand the size of the country, which I think is a very, very important distinction. Um, revanchism is kind of a nonsense uh, term for nationalists in the United Kingdom, though they may, you know, uh, Wales may think that their border expe- extends further east into England than you know, Scotland may think that they extend further down. But it's mostly a, re- a reductive thing. Uh, there's a, you know... Um, England an English nationalist wants independence for England from the United Kingdom because, among other things, the Scots and Irish and Welsh are allowed to vote on policies that affect England, but England is not allowed to vote on many policies that uh, affect Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is known as the West Lothian question. I suppose there's a such thing as a British nationalist, but like it's it's not it doesn't really. It doesn't really make sense. You can also like it's an interesting thing to look at. You can find maps plotted of, um, you know, wh- where like like how many people identify as Britons and how many people identify as English and almost no one identifies as British mm-hmm. outside of England and identifying as British is mostly a Southern England thing and Northern England what do not consider themselves British and generally are very adamant that they're English. So. That's, you know, kind of the nickel tour through that. There is an attempt by some on the right to brand as American nationalists. It makes a bit of sense, um, but it's more about, I mean, the, the thing is, like, what makes more sense in terms of being, like, coherent is um, breaking, you know, like, nationalism as black nationalism, um, the desire for an independent state for blacks usually in the what's called the black belt of the American South. Uh, the uh, white nationalists want part of the Northwest. Uh, Chicano nationalism wants an independent state for Mexican-Americans in the American Southwest. I, I, I am opposed to all of these ideologies. I think that America is a multiracial, multiethnic, multiconfessional state. I would like for it to remain such. Um, I certainly am not one of these people who's who's happy about America balkanizing. Uh, I think that you know if that's balk, balkanization is great if you're, uh, the balkanization of uh, the United States is great if you're Chinese, but it's probably not great for anybody else. I don't mean Chinese American. I mean you know in Beijing, um, you know because yeah, like, it'd be a lot easier to dominate fifty two different little countries. Yeah, I mean look what happened to Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union. You know, is what is Serbia some powerhouse mm-hmm. of the world now? Um, Russia's dead, kinda, <laughs> I guess. But yeah, it just makes your country weaker. I mean, it's very, very, I think, well established at this point. So it's sort of a reverse irredentism. 
Uh, black nationalists, as our example, are not looking to reclaim that lost territory. They want to carve off a part of the United States for themselves. American nationalism is really just you know, what's called American nationalism, really just kind of patriotism um, in, it, in its true sense. American symbols are civic symbols, not ethnic ones. That's another important distinction. The American flag, uh, Columbia, who was the symbol of America before the uh, Uncle Sam rollout, eagles, fireworks, colonial garb, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, uh, the pride in military, scientific, cultural, commercial achievements of the United States. Um, you know, how does a... How does a how does the statue of the Marines raising the flag at Iwo Jima make you feel? What about a photograph of Neil Armstrong landing on the moon? The works of Mark Twain, a 1968 Camaro. You know, I mean, we have a very I, I hate this idea that Americans have uh, no culture. It's like, why don't you people get some food and then talk to me about how how I don't have any uh, culture? I think that people who say that come to America and exclusively go to McDonald's and drink Budweiser. And who they're, can they're blame not looking them? for it? They're not going to find it. They don't want to see it. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, okay. It's like these people would post pictures of a uh, some three gas stations and a Wendy's next to each other and say, "Look how ugly America is." Yeah, let's yeah, let's sure. let's post that picture of Breezewood, Pennsylvania, for the fiftieth time, as if like. A rest yeah. stop in Pennsylvania. It's the entire is. country. Yeah, that's so what the whole country looks like. Literally, if you turned your head 30 degrees, you'd see <laughs> just gorgeous <laughs> landscape. But no, no, it's of course it's 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 Hardee's with a with a broken down Pinto in front of it. Yeah, American patriotism celebrates and venerates what we might call the American way of life. Roughly speaking, I would say that this means the freedom to start a business, own a home, leave a job, own a gun, consume media of your own choosing what most Americans would identify as freedom in a broad sense, not in the um, sort of libertarian sense of, uh, you know, drilling down into everything. Um, I think that most Americans believe in, you know, some vague notion of, 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 of freedom. And again, this returns us to the concept of patriotism. I think that patriotism is different from nationalism in that it, uh, it necessarily includes a commitment to a certain set of ideals. So I think that this idea that it's like, you know, viewing it as this entirely mercenary um, phenomenon that just says anything goes and, you know, uh, uh, the ends justifies the means is, is, is not a bad way to start talking about it, but I think that it's much more complicated than that. Um, the missing key to the puzzle is what is called ethnogenesis. Um, I would argue that, one could make the case that Britain is now a nation and that the constituent nations of the UK are basically just, you know, these kind of, you know, they're like Liechtenstein or Andorra. They're just these holdovers from a million years ago that somehow exist into the uh, 21st century. Um, again, I talked about how when you fill in your census form in the UK, you have to fill in a nationality. And in Southern England, people are much more likely to put British than people in Northern England. Uh, similarly, American on a census form is basically just a euphemism for the Scotch Irish. So what do we, uh, why can't we talk about American nationalism? Why is that kind of a, a, a nonsense term? America does not have an ethnogenesis. What is ethnogenesis? Very, very fancy 50 cent word, meaning the creation of the nation. There's no single clear event that makes a British nation separate from the constituent nations that formed it. Uh, there's disagreement as to whether or not there has ever been a British nation. But the United States, it's very clear. There is no event or series of events that fuses all of the peoples of the United States into a single, mostly unified ethnicity. Americans today... Uh, re remain largely separated by race and ethnicity. White people tend to marry white people. Uh, black people tend to marry black people. Chinese tend to marry Chinese, or, or at least Asians tend to marry, marry other Asians. Um, this is not like, I'm not saying this is good, bad, or anything else. This is just, that's, most people marry, you know, within their own um, uh, ethnic communities. And, uh, you know, this has been true throughout most of American history. And, what, the reason I bring that up is because there's no ethne. There's no 
like what what is an ethnic american when i put it that way it really i think really makes sense because like there's no such thing as an ethnic american right i mean if you look go back to like kids books in the 1920s and and uh you know they're like people of the world and there's a picture of an american and it's a white guy uh it's a white guy because the country's 90 percent white you know uh it's 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 not like you can't be an american if you're not white it's just most people in america uh are and were are and were white um and that would that would have been why but there's not like an an american ethnicity is is a strange kind of um idea that i think most people have not really thought about because when i ask you know if i were to to um if i were to in the manner of uh kellyanne conway say what's your ethnicity you're not going to say american you're going to say i'm oh well, i'm russian and german and italian or i'm french and british and dutch or whatever it is your 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 ethnic makeup is like if somebody asked me what my ethnicity was i would say i was german german dutch and english um i i put american on my census form because uh mostly as a sort of like semi political statement to say like you know i'm not oh is that uh, an option on your census form oh yeah oh yeah the scotch irish do it that's their thing that's I'm, their whole that's their whole thing man yeah you can definitely put huh, um, no kidding put american on I, it. I i never seen one um well, there's a line where you put in nationality, and you can put in, I mean, you can put Jedi in if you're extremely cringe and Reddit, but you can put anything on that, and I usually <laughs> fill it in as um, as American because, yeah, I mean, I'm an American. My ancestors have been here since since before there was an America. You know, like it's not, it's like like other groups of people in this country. Uh, who are, you know, who, I think every group of people in this country is somebody says, all of you need to go back home. And it's like, man, where am I, where am I going? <laughs> you know, my, my people been here for 400 years. Like where, where am I going back to? So <laughs> you go to your house. I could do. Um, can there be nationalism or patriotism without a political entity of any kind? I think that when discussing nationalism, it's pretty, pretty easy to say yes the list of identities that existed before there was a nation to unite them is extensive but is it your contention that there were no serbians czechs or irish before there was a serbia chechia and ireland D yes there absolutely was i mean there's in the case of like uh, the czech and there's other um you know ethnic identities like this that like they were sort of formed in uh Bel belarusian is another one there's a sort of um you know it's during the period of romantic but i think uh bulgarian might be another one anyway there's a whole period in 19th century called the romantic nationalist period where like germans who live in in the southeastern part of the german empire start like thinking that uh, bohemian culture from 500 years ago is cool and start resurrecting the Czech language and things like that. But cool. That's their ethnogenesis. I mean, I'm not saying they're not Czech because they clearly are. They speak Czech. They live in a country called Chechia. Um, they, you know, they're Czech, but they, they were and they, and this was, they, they were on, you know, you could fill that out on, you could put Czech on your census form in the, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, the German Empire. So clearly, um, you you know, nationalism can exist even if there's not a state to support it. On the other hand, can you be a patriot of a state that doesn't exist? Kind of a weird question. When we speak of the patriots of the American Revolution, it's certainly true that the war was underway, uh, and there were still, at least as far as the world was concerned, that these people were an in integral part of the British Empire. On the other hand, they were also patriots for an incipient state, what would eventually become the United States of America. If the patriots of the American Revolution had failed, and I think that um, apologies to Harry Turtledove, there's not, you know, you can't really do alternate history because things happened a certain way and it's just you know, what happened. But let's just for a second um i don't know that we would have something called american patriotism i mean and if we did if the american revolution failed and we did have um 
American patriotism. It would be much more like neo-Confederate kind of like, you know, it would be a LARP, basically. Like, you know, you're not a Confederate. <laughs> Sorry. You're not a Confederate. Uh, you will never no, be a Confederate. Yeah. Yeah, not. I guess I'm not. No one has been a Confederate since 1865. Sorry. Even if I paint the Confederate flag on the hood of my Jetta? Man, uh, maybe if you jump in through the window when the door is closed, I'll allow it. I got to roll the window down first. I'll get right on that. We call it because, you know, when we call it the general we. It's such a little car. <laughs> Great. <laughs> 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 editor, editor, make that part louder. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, if we contrast that to, say, the uh, ethnogenesis uh, of, say, the Serbian people, if the, you know, attempt to separate the principality of Serbia from the Ottoman Empire had failed, there would still be a Serbian people. There would still be a Serbian nation. There wouldn't be a Serbian state, but there would be Serbian people, Serbian nation, Serbian culture, Serbian language, Serbian food, Serbian music, etc. cetera. Um, I think that if America were like conquered tomorrow, we would still have an American identity. But if the American revolution had failed, it's difficult to say what American identity would be. I mean, you know, I, I don't even know. It's so it's such, such a bizarre question to me that I don't want to wade into it. Um we talked a bit at the beginning about how nationalism is often seen as just patriotism gone wrong. Um, I think that that is flawed for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, let's talk about the nationalism of occupied nations. N uh, Serbia occupied by the Ottomans, uh, wanting their independence. Is that just is that just patriotism gone too far? What about the what about Irish nationalism under British rule? Uh, I think that it's pretty nonsensical when we're talking about occupied nations, historical and contemporary, that this is like, you know, nationalism gone wrong. Now, let's talk about existing or dominant nation states. It's sort of less a less silly description. But, um, you know, if, if the difference between French patriotism and French nationalism is only that French patriotism is good and French nationalism is bad, then that word doesn't mean anything. It's just a subjective um, term being used by the speaker to judge the person in, in question. So, you know, I, I just, I find that to be like a really intellectually lazy way of parsing these two out. And you know what? A lot of this could just be kind of, you know, semantic, but it, otherwise it, it's just, if you define it that way, it's just an, an attaboy or what a bad boy. Further criticism leveled at the notion of nationalism is that it involves uh, veneration of the state and kind of, kind of worship of the state that's absent in patriotism. Um, again, I don't think that this really passes a lot of muster. Um, Orwell, this is Orwell's, Orwell put this forward. Um, I like Orwell. I, I know that uh, kind of some people on the right are like tired of Orwell and like to beat up on him because uh, he's invoked so much. But like, I think Orwell was brilliant and and quite prescient in his appraisal. And um, what's the uh, Wigan Pier? The, 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 the... Anyway, um, Orwell has some hilarious writings about uh, socialists, which he was. But uh, Orwell was like, you know. A, a consistent and principled socialist whose main, uh, you know, affinity was for the British working class. It was not just this kind of like ide ideology he adopted as because he was some maladapted weirdo. Uh, it's really, it's actually, I want to, well, I won't find it because it's not worth it. It's not on topic, but uh, something about Wigan Pier is the title of, anyway. Um, let's talk about Western continental Europe. You know, nationalists are basically dissidents there. So how are they worshipping the state? The main nationalist party, the National Rally, which is formerly known as the National Front, opposes the mainstream conservative parties and is basically, I mean, at the time I wrote this was a marginalized um, a political party. But now Marine Le Pen is, you know, I think the smart money will be the next president of France. Um they might want to exercise the power of the state, but that doesn't make them any different than any other political party competing for power in the public sphere. Their entire raison d'etre is to be critical of most of the post-war political tradition of global liberalism, 
um, and elements of the social democratic welfare state. This is true of basically every uh, party in Europe. That is what is you know sort of a uh, lumped under the term nationalist or national populist or any of these Aust- Austria's Freedom Party, Sweden Democrats, Alternative for Germany. Um, you know, they, if anything, want to erode state power because they want most of them want to get rid of the EU, which is the primary, you know, the kind of the, the uber state of 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 Europe. Um, and they, you know, the, the EU is used to route around democracy and put technocrats in charge and make sure that the plebs can't have their say with their silly little elections. Sometimes it's nationalism is patriotism plus state worship. This is, a, um, I think, a relic of the post-war period and the relationship between, of nationalism and fascism. And it's a, an attempt to conflate the two. Um, I think that at some point in history, this may have been a, a fair um, conflation. But, you know, because at this time, most of the nationalists were fascists and most of the fascists were nationalists. It was, there was not a lot of daylight between these two things at this point in time, which is, which is not to say it was a perfect circle Venn diagram. There were plenty of uh, nationalist organizations in Germany and Italy who opposed fascism and who were hated by the fascists. But, you know, I think that we are, we are not being intellectually honest if we don't acknowledge um, that phenomenon. But I just don't think that it, I don't think that it uh, is is relevant anymore. I don't think that it uh, explains very much to people. It's not very illuminating. So there's difference between pa- patriotism and nationalism, but there's a common thread that connects them. The differences flow from whether or not nationalism or patriotism are appropriate to a given country and whether or not it meshes with their um, history. And you don't have to be a nationalist or a patriot, but one is neither necessarily good, bad, or you know, indifferent. So who cares? And I think that's a fair question to ask with this. I think that it's an interesting topic. I think that it's at a very high philosophical level, sort of necessarily speaking, but why does it matter? It matters because of the situational context, um, as well as, you know, insulating yourself from being manipulated by the press, the corporate sector, the toadies and the NGOs, all of whom are hostile towards nationalism and patriotism. I would argue they're also generally hostile towards conservatism. Um, I think that, you know, uh, libertarianism is, is somewhat more amenable because it has, it's basically a, a system that doesn't have many values other than the market, uh, which is, a, I admit, a gross oversimplification, but um, I think is definitely a thing that makes it kind of more palatable to a certain uh, type of person in the corporate sector anyway. But in certain countries, nationalism is reductive, regressive, uh, seeks to divide the country against itself by splitting off different demographics to its own. I would argue that the two biggest uh, geopolitical tragedies, disasters of the 20th century were the breakup of the Soviet Union, by which I do not mean the fall of communism. I mean the breakup of the Soviet Union into its constituent republics. Um, This was you know, not a, a, a given when communism began to fall. Um, there was quite a bit of movement to uh, replace the Soviet Union with a free association of these, I think it's uh, 16 republics, because I just had to sing the Soviet national anthem in my head to remember how many there were. But, I, I, you know, I think that that was an absolute disaster for those people. Um, and that was the result of nationalism. So it's like, is nas- am I saying nationalism is always good? No, I absolutely don't think that it is. I think it can be good. I think it can be bad. I think patriotism can be, uh, you know, good or bad. I mean, we've talked in the past about what patriotism was like during the Bush years. It was this kind of gross worship of the uh, of the military, the person of George W. Bush, uh, this willingness to give up your freedom to, you know, defeat the terrorists or whatever. Um, I don't, I don't recall, I don't think back on that period fondly. Um, and I doubt many people listening to this podcast do. I think that if we want to get into a even more extreme example of how this kind of reductive nationalism can be destructive, uh, at a much more visceral level, let's talk about Yugoslavia. Cause I love to talk about Yugoslavia because I think that it is, uh, I think that Yugoslavia is actually has a really cool history because through the struggle against, and they had an ethnogenesis, by the way, 
through the struggle against the Nazis uh, and their puppet state uh, and the Chetnik militias that were allied with them, the uh, were the Chetniks allied with them, or were they just the homegrown fascists? I don't remember. We wanted to throw them out so they so they could be the so they could be the the fascists. Uh, I don't know. I just know we're selling their uh, we're selling Igman Ammunitions two twenty three on our site now, which was founded to supply the Yugoslav National Army. So there's the only connection I can make. Yeah. So the Chetniks actually the Chet I, I apologize the Chetniks. Um, the Chetniks, I guess, worked with fascist Italy, um, but they were, you know, a Serbian, a Serbian nationalist uh, guerrilla group. But any, anyway, it's getting kind of digression. Um, you know, Yugoslavia had. You can go to the Yugoslavia Wikipedia page and find the exact numbers on it. But basically, what happened with with Yugoslavia was that there was, you know, six, seven, eight, whatever it is, different groups of people who were kind of the same. And I know that all the, I know all you South Slavs listening to this are going to be like enraged by this, but like, you know, there goes our entire audience, man, there, there goes our, <laughs> there goes, uh, our, our editor. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that like, I think that at the very least, Yugoslavia was undergoing ethnogenesis until the death of Tito, because Tito, uh, who I think is, you know, a very complex character. And if you just go, what? He's a communist. Um, Tito was a very, very complicated person. And you should develop a nuanced and intelligent view of who he was, or you're missing out on some really serious and important lessons of history. Um, I admire Tito. I admire Marshall Tito greatly. It doesn't mean that I want a Marshall Tito in the United States. It just means that I think that, um, you know, he has some things that we can look to and say that he did that were good in the world and, and that were large, that were hugely good in the world. Uh, there's a little bakery I used to go to, it's owned by a man who I believe was Bosniak, and he had a um, portrait of uh, Marshall Tito in above, you know, the back wall of his bakery. And me being the type of uh, shy, introverted guy that I am, I said, hey, Marshall Tito. And he just says, yeah, some people don't like that I have that picture up, but I don't care. And basically what he did was through force and uh, you know, through kind of like the John, what was called the Johnson method with Lyndon Mids Johnson where LBJ when he was in the Senate would say or do literally anything to get you to vote a certain way. He would harangue you. He would cry. He would anything he had to do to get a vote. He would do it. And Tito basically applied that method to forming a new country made up of these, whatever, six to eight, na- six to eight constituent nationalities who had more, let me put it this way, who had more in common than not. Um, and said, you know what, for the last 600 years or whatever it was, all they've done, all these bigger powers of Europe have done is divide us against one another, pit Serb against Croat, um, and we're not doing that anymore. We are Yugoslavs now. And you can watch on census forms when people report their nationality up until the death of Marshal Tito, the percentage of people who identified as Yugoslav increased. Uh, if, when I meet Yugoslavs in the United States, one of the which I'm using as a collective for the various nationalities uh, that comprise Yugoslavia, usually one it, one of the first questions that I ask them is, "What do you identify as? Do you identify as Yugoslav or uh, Montenegrin or whatever you know the case may be?" And I, I don't think I've ever had somebody say that they didn't identify that they that they chafed at the idea that they were Yugoslav. They may have said, no, I just kind of, you know, I consider myself Macedonian. But usually the answer is, well, I consider myself a Yugoslav of Serbian heritage or, or whatever. Uh, this is like people who are from there. I'm not talking about you know, a guy whose parents moved here in the 90s or, or something like that. Uh, and when Tito died, because he was pretty much the only thing holding the country together, it all started to fall apart. It basically became a Serbian a Serbian state, which is what it had been prior to Marshal Tito. Um, it was just Serbia with, you know, that was bigger. Um, and I think that, I think that there are few things in the world more beautiful than convincing 
a bunch of um, weak and divided people who have been pushed around by their bigger, stronger neighbors to band together and focus on their common on their commonalities rather than their differences to make a space for themselves and a life for their children. God, if there's anything in the world more beautiful than that, I just don't know what it is. Um, I, I, I just find the, that story and that ideal to be so inspiring. And then you look at what happened after they split up, you know, it's this playground for world powers. And there was obviously this brutal genocidal war that lasted for several years. That was, nightmarish in its execution. So I just don't see like this American Balkanism. People are like, well, we just need to balkanize and break off and everybody can go their own way. Um, I don't know how you think that's going to turn out. It's not going to be five awesome Americas. It's going to be five crappy Americas that are always fighting with each other and dominated by Russia, England, Germany, China, you know, whoever. Um, patriotism, again, identi- not identical, uh, similar arises in countries that are not united by a single ethnic group, but it, but an ethos and a culture. Um, the United States is such a country. You know what else is? The People's Republic of China. You know, Han Chinese are not the only people in China. And one of the early flags of the Republic of China, uh, I believe the one prior to the Kuomintang flag, though it may have been adopted like in the middle somewhere, but the, one of the, one of the early flags of the Republic of China before it became the people's Republic of China was a flag that was called the flag of five nations, because that was the idea. Five nations banded together to form China. It's like the Han, the Manchu, the Tibetans, uh, the, I think the Uyghurs were maybe a part of that. Um, but anyway, that's how they viewed themselves. We're five countries that are coming together because for the last, however many hundred years, We've thought of ourselves as being separate and maybe we're not that separate. And maybe if we stop thinking, maybe if we stop focusing on our differences rather than our commonalities, we can stick together and carve out a little uh, patch of earth for ourselves. And boy, have they certainly done that. You know, I mean, I don't I'm not one of these based China guys, but um, I think that they're you know, I think that it's very admirable when when people who have been divided and pitted against each other uh, who have quite a bit in common. Uh, come together and decide that they're going to forge a common identity. Switzerland, we talked about, was another <clears throat> example of that. Uh, I think both of these are kind of bogeymen of, of, of global elites that want people to just think of themselves as uh, consumers and, you know, what's your identity? I'm a Star Wars fan kind of stuff. I like the Marvel Universe. Um <laughs> I'm a Red Sox fan or whatever, you know, whatever this stupid consumerist crap that they try and push on us is. Uh, I think that for me personally, that is, there's other reasons. I mean, one is just, I just love this country. You know, I just love this country and want what's best for this country. And that's the starting point of my politics is like, what's good for America. And I don't mean the government. I don't mean the rich. I don't, you know, I don't even necessarily mean like only the little guy. I kind of mean, What's good for the people who live in this country for the next 200 years? That's what I think about, Um, you know, but I also think that nationalism and uh, patriotism are kind of one of the only firewalls that we have against this hyper consumerist ideology that is, you know, I I was going to say taking over America, but like, God, like, I don't want to use that verb tense because it implies that it's like a thing that hasn't been mostly completed. So I think that's kind of like the main takeaway is I just want you to stop hearing these words and reacting to them as if there's something that you need to defend or something that you need to like, you know, jerk your knee about and your um, uh, the, the reactive defenses of, and just think about it in a more nuanced perspective with a longer historical view. And with that said, this is the point of the podcast where I tell you that you need to go to ammo.com forward slash podcast, where you can get $20 off any order of $200 or more. Uh, we have most common calibers in stock. I every time I go into a, a gun store, which is very, very rarely, because I, you know, I know that we have ammo and they don't. But I'm always surprised. Like the, the shortages are still going on. They're not going on at ammo.com. We have pretty much everything you're looking for: your nine, your t- two twenty three, your ten, your forty four, forty five. Um, little out of the five five six right now. You may have heard that they're, you know, you may have heard what's going on with Russian ammunition. Or not so that's it was what, what's the Russian one we don't have anymore? 
762.39, but we got yeah, plenty of it by uh, oh, we're back. Yeah, Igman and Privy Partisan and Cellier and Bella. And all these guys are, are stepping it up. That's funny because my immediate thought when that happened was, okay, so we're just going to start buying <laughs> it's going to be Yugoslavian weapons. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I yeah. mean, Privy Partisan was probably, uh, they probably heated up the uh, the rolling presses when they got that noose. We have a really cool article about them uh, on the website, by the way, where you can learn more about the history of Yugoslavia and the Yugoslav partisans. Um, please do not just dismiss it because they were communists. Um, if they, you know, they were like v- v- the most based communists in like the history of communism, and they have a really cool story. And you don't have to, em- you know, embrace Marxism Leninism to like admire their their heroism. Um, and the way that they fought against, you know, the Red Army didn't dare go into Yugoslavia. Let me put it that way. The, the Red Army was probably more terrified of the Yugoslavs than it was anyone else that was like sitting at their doors. So um, cool story, bro. Ammo.com forward slash podcast. $20 off any order of $200 or more. Once again, I am Sam Jacobs for Dave Trello. This has been the Resistance Library podcast. Thanks. And we'll see you next time.